want to go to 2 Samuel, and we're going to go to specifically chapter 9, okay? And did anyone not get their Bible reading in today? Just kidding. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I'm just playing. If you did not get your Bible reading in, you're about to, okay? We're about to read a pretty lengthy passage, but I really think, listen to me, I think there are many of you who probably did not even realize this story was in your Bible, but I'm really praying that as you leave here tonight, this is a new landmark moment in the scriptures for you, that one day you can come back and revisit and remember what God drops in your heart. Is that cool? Second Samuel chapter nine, we'll start reading at verse one. It says this, David asked, this is King David, David asked, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David and the king said to him, are you Ziba and the, at your service? He replied, the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame though in both of his feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is, in a, he is at the house of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodabar. So the king David brought him, to, uh, brought for him from Lodabar, from the house of Maker, son of uh, Amiel. When Mephibosheth, that's the guy's name. I know that is a mouthful, but this is the guy we are looking at tonight. Mephibosheth. If you ever want to flex your Bible knowledge on somebody, just tell them, have you ever heard of Mephibosheth? Okay. Then be like, what did you just say? Okay. Exactly. Okay. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down again and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything belonging to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring him the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, the grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and, 27, and 20 servants. When Ziba said, then Ziba said to the king, your servant will do whatever the Lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. One of the king's sons. I know it's a lengthy passage a scripture. Some of you are like, I got my Bible reading in for the rest of the year, okay? But man, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I believe that if the Holy Spirit helps me to preach this message like I feel it, I really think that this story is going to reorient some things in your interior world. I think there are some things that have been chaotic. There are some moments that have been dis, in disarray. There are some even some pockets, nooks, crannies, and corners of your heart that you thought, this, it's always going to be this way. It's always just going to it's always gonna be subpar. It's always gonna be less than the best. And I'm praying that tonight God would somehow use this moment to go right for that and show you that you don't have to stay the same way you walked in here. Amen? If you're taking notes tonight, I'm gonna preach a message that I'm titling this, Stop Squirming. Stop Squirming. If you're a note taker in the house of God, which I highly encourage you to be, if I see you on your phone, I'm going to tell myself you are taking notes. Title this message, Stop Squirming. Can we pray? Is that cool? Am I allowed to do that? Yes. Praise the Lord. Awesome. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you right now for the moments that we are going to share around your word. Lord, this is your story. This is your moment, God. I understand that I'm the human being on this platform holding a microphone, but Lord, I pray that they wouldn't hear from me. They would hear from you. Lord, I pray that right now, as I've prayed so often, you would put me on like a glove and you would go to work in your children's hearts and in your children's lives. Lord, I thank you that things that have seemed desolate, that things that have seemed forgotten, that things that have seemed null and void, Lord, I thank you that your miraculous hand would touch it and breathe life on it once again. Lord, I thank you for each and every single person under the sound of my voice, whether they have walked with you for years or they are just kind of checking things out. Lord, I thank you that they would see your goodness, God, they would see your love, maybe for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Lord, I thank you that you're going to do what only you can do. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And everybody said, come on. 
Amen. You can do better than that. Come on. Amen. Let's go. This is Texas. All right. I remember not that long ago. Um, remember not that long ago. Some of you are like, wow, what a transition. I agree. Okay. But I remember not that long ago. Um, I w- I, you have to understand, I come from a very large family. Anybody understand? My mom and dad, they did not have TV. Okay. So they had to do something with their time. And that was called procreation. Okay. And so my mom and dad just started popping kids out. All right. And so, um, I am the oldest of seven children. All right. I'm the oldest of seven kids. And, uh, not too long ago, I'm married now, but I haven't always been married. Okay. I got married, um, about a year and three months ago. Okay. And so this is this moment I'm going to tell you about is before God graced me with my wife, all right? So I was still living at home, and I remember one summer, we were gonna go on a family vacation, and we were gonna go to, to the Bahamas, all right? And so I remember we got out to the Bahamas, and we're chilling there, we're on this cruise, right? We're like out in the middle of the ocean, which I was totally afraid of, um, until I actually got on the boat, okay? And how many of you know, there are things you're afraid of until you actually give them a try. Come on, I'm preaching before I preach tonight. Some of you are afraid of things you never even tried before, and God's saying, step onto the boat. Come on, somebody, all right. That illustration ends there. But I got on the boat. Got on the boat. We're chilling. And uh, first stop we have is this little, little port in the Bahamas. So we get off and we're chilling there. And I'm in a foreign country, right? So I'm going to do the thing that I told myself I would never do, right? I was like, I am going to swim shirtless. <laughs> I'm going to swim shirtless. Ain't nobody around here know who I am, okay? I was born thick, okay? I have to tell you right now. I was born thick. So for a long time, I was like, I, I, I don't want to unveil this. this the, the earth is not groaning and waiting for the manifestation of Kena Clark's four chest hairs, okay? It is not, all right? So I remember, I finally, you know, I was like, you know what? Let's risk it for the biscuit. You know, I'm going to run around on this, on this beach with my shirt off. And so I'm running around, and you have to understand, there are white people, and then there are me. Okay, like I'm white, but I'm like white, all right? Some people are like, yo, you're white. No, I'm like white. Like I will help you illuminate the road in front of you if your car lights ever go out, okay? So I'm white, all right? Which means the sun and I do not always agree, okay? So we're, I'm outside on this beach. I'm running around with my shirt off and I'm sitting there with my family. We're having a great time, splish, blast. I was taking a bath. It was a good old moment, all right? So finally, it's time for us to go back to the cruise ship, right? I get on the cruise ship, and how many of you know there is just something about artificial lighting that reveals things to you the sun did not reveal? I'll just say that, all right? So I got under this artificial lighting um, in my room and realized I now transformed into a lobster, okay? I am completely, thank you, Karis, I am completely sunburned, all right? I'm completely, literally, I, I, I'm roasted, okay? And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like, what the heck am I gonna do? This is the first day of family vacation, okay? We have five more days of this, okay? What am I gonna do? So I'm sitting there, and I like meander over to my dad. You know, you're not wanting any part of your body to touch another part of your body, you know? I'm meandering over to my dad's room, and I'm like, you know? And finally, he comes out, and I'm like, dad, I'm roasted! He's like, yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, you are. Okay. And so I was like, dad, what, what am I going to do? All right. My wife has taught me how to do this thing now. It's called think. <laughs> she taught me how to do that. Okay. It's crazy. I'm still, I'm still work in progress. I'm still getting good at it, but I didn't think. Okay. And so I walk up to him and he's like, all right, Kenan, um, what you're going to need to do is you are going to need to wear a shirt. That's what you're going to need to do. You're going to wear a shirt. I was like, great idea, okay? And so he's like, there's no problem. He's like, luckily, I think the Lord saw this coming. He had me pack a little extra. He was like, I have the perfect swim shirt for you. I was like, you are the man, okay? You are a man of God. So all of a sudden, he hands me this swim shirt. I go to bed, don't get a wink of sleep that night because my blankets feel like knives, okay? This is horrible. So I'm laying in bed. We wake up the next day and we've got to go to the famous Atlantis resort. Okay. Famous Atlantis resort. Um, And you have to be honest. I have to be honest. Like I grew up watching the commercials about the famous 
Atlantis Resort, okay? There's this great montage of like kids and ripped dads. Like who ever heard of a ripped dad, okay? But there are ripped dads running through this Atlantis water park with their toddlers. Their toddlers are totally behaving, okay? Like I didn't realize, but this is all paid people here, okay? Something in this whole montage of this commercial is going through my head and I can't wait to get there, right? But there's this one point in the commercial where there was this iconic water slide, okay, an iconic water slide, and the water slide, you have to understand, it goes straight down, and then it shoots you into a tube, okay, and the tube is clear, and the clear tube that it shoots you in goes underwater, okay, and to make it, to up the ante just a little bit, the water the tube shoots you into is shark infested, okay, this is every young man's dream, okay, this is amazing, so I'm like, I cannot wait, to find this slide. So me and my brothers, you have to understand, I'm the oldest, I have a little bit of a complex, okay? So I find them and I'm like, guys, I will beat you down this water slide. So we find the water slide. I have my little nice swim shirt on provided by my daddy, you know? And we make our way over to this water slide, okay? The line is literally as long as eternity, okay? And so we're standing there and, you know, we made some friends and we we had a good laugh. And then finally we get to the top and I'm gonna be the, the first down the slide. And so you know how the water slides go. They, you, you sit in that little thing and you wait for the lifeguard to tell you to go and the water's just like shooting all around you and you're sitting there waiting for him to give you the go. And I have to tell you, I, I, I realized like this is years ago, by the way, years ago. I have grown is what I'm trying to say, okay? But I am sitting there and I am talking all sorts of mad trash to my brothers, okay? I am the voice of the accuser in this moment, okay? And I'm sitting there just talking all sorts of crap to my brothers about how I am going to beat them. They better tie me. Oh, wait, you left your phone at home because you're a weenie, okay? Like, uh, it, it's gonna be, I'm just talking all sorts of, of, of trash to them, okay? And I'm sitting there and I, I'm holding on to the little bar and I'm waiting for this 16-year-old lifeguard to say, go, okay? And I'm looking at him and he finally goes, all right, dude, you can go. And I yell this at the top of my lungs. I go, see you at the bottom, boys. I grab the bar. I fling myself forward. I cross my arms and my legs, and I just go, Eek! <laughs> And I'm looking at them. They're looking at me. Water's going all around me like I'm about to drown. Like, I have been waterboarded. It's not fun, okay? And so I'm sitting there, water shooting all around me, and I'm like, bloop, bloop, and like, what's going on? Here, I'm not moving. And so all of a sudden the lifeguard like comes over and he says, um, hey, hey, bro, um, I think your shirt is stuck on the slide. I said, what? And he said, I think your shirt is stuck on the slide. I said, okay. So all of a sudden, you know, have you ever tried to peel wet clothes off of you, let alone like spandex? Okay. So I'm sitting there and I'm trying to get this shirt to unstick. And finally, I, you know, flop to the edge of the slide. Gravity does what, thank God, gravity does. And it takes me down, right? And shoots me into the little shark infested waters and I waited at the bottom to be ridiculed by my two younger brothers, okay? And so I get to the bottom, they come down and and they they poked all sorts of of fun at me. But yeah, I want you to see this and this is the reason I tell you that ridiculous and some of you are like, this is a total pointless story. It's not pointless. The reason I tell you that story is to show you this. It was my attempt to cover my pain yet still try to live a legendary life that held me back from where I wanted to go. My attempt to cover up my pain and just try to act like everything was cool, still act like I was the man, still act like I had it all together, when underneath I was quite literally, whoo, I was in pain. So, many of the time, so much of the time, I think our response to our own pain ends up holding us back than the pain ever actually could. I think the way we respond to our own pain, the things that we self-medicate with, can end up becoming more tools of the enemy than the pain actually ever was. It was my attempt to just kind of cover up and try to mosey on down the road and not really deal with the situation that ended up holding me back. And I'm telling you tonight, I'm here to tell you that is no way to live. That is not God's best for you, my friend. God is not looking for onward Christian soldier, kumbaya little you, to strap yourself up by your bootstraps and get on down the heavenly yellow brick road so you can walk in your future. No, God wants to actually heal the real you. God's not sitting there saying, hey, rub some dirt in it and keep running. 
I think that's a God, I think that's the God religion painted for a lot of us. Is a God who says, no, no, there's no time for that. We've got a world to save. I don't care that you're hurt. But, but, but put a cast on it and let's go. Sometimes the way that we try to self-medicate our own pain can end up causing us more problems than the actual pain ever could. And I want to let you know tonight, if you are living with pain, and yes, I do mean physically, I want to let you know that thank God, because of Jesus, we don't have to exclude physical pain. We serve a healing God. But maybe your pain is a little bit quite literally deeper than a physical need. Maybe you've got emotional pain. Maybe, if we could dare to be honest, you've got some spiritual pain. Maybe you've got sexual pain. Maybe you've got relational pain. I don't know what kind of pain you are dealing with tonight, but I'm here to tell you, you came to the right place. God's not called you to just limp through this life, slap a Band-Aid on it, and call it a day. He's ready to actually get to the heart of the matter. In the story that we looked at a moment ago in 2 2 Samuel chapter 9, we found a young man, a young man by the name of Mephibosheth. It's a hard name to say, Mephibosheth. You kind of have to get your prayer language before you can actually say that one. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has to help, okay? But Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth's story, as you saw a moment ago, is a bit of a tragic one. But before we dive into the different nuances of Mephibosheth's story and specifically his pain, I want us to start at verse one because I think there are some things God wants to show us before we even begin to talk about Mephibosheth. In verse one of 2 Samuel chapter nine, we see that King David, you remember King David, right? King David killed Goliath. You remember that guy? If you don't know that, you now do, okay? King David killed this guy named Goliath and King David is now king. And he's been king for a second. And all of a sudden, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, King David pipes up and he says, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? Is there anybody left in the house of Saul? Now, before I get to the, how erroneous it is, how crazy it is, how bombastic it is that he says the name Saul, I want to talk about that word, anyone. Is there Anyone. And I think for a lot of us, we think that God is looking for a specific someone. I think for a lot of us, when God begins to look to and fro upon the earth, when his eyes begin to go back and forth as to who he is going to bless, as to who he is going to elevate, as to who he is going to give himself to, we can begin to think that God is looking for a specific person, a someone, a perfect one, a flawless one a far more righteous one than me. But what I came to tell you tonight, and I know that I'm already preaching the gospel, but that's the beautiful thing about this story, is the gospel is layered all the way through. I'm here to tell you, Jesus did not just come for someone. He came for anyone. Jesus is not looking for the religious elite. Jesus is not looking for everybody who's crossed their T's and dotted their I's, that they've minded their P's and their Q's, that they've managed to walk the, the, the perfect, straight, and narrow road. No, Jesus comes and he says, I don't know what you've heard about Jesus, but he's just looking for anyone. Is there anyone that I can show kindness to? Is there anyone that I can bless? And I'm here to tell you tonight, if you would step forward, John 3, 16 says, for whosoever, he's a for whosoever kind of God. He's an anyone kind of God. I don't care what sexual baggage you walked in here with. I don't care what relational baggage you walked in here with. I don't care what substance is currently flowing through your veins. He's an anyone kind of God. I don't care. I don't care where you're at. I don't care whoever's watching this on YouTube or listening to me on a podcast. You may be on death row right now. Thank God we serve an anyone kind of God. David starts looking to and fro and says, is there there anyone? Not is there one from the house of Saul worthy enough for the king to be kind to them? He just says, "Is is there like anyone? I think right now more than ever, especially with the direction our world's going, especially our country, and that's all I'm going to say about that. I think right now God is looking for anyone like never before. He's looking for anyone. And the good thing is our God loves to use the dirty 
He loves to use the disenfranchised. He loves to use the marginalized. He loves to use the minority. He loves to use the people every other person would count out. He says, you're actually the one I want to build it all on. You're actually going to be the face of this thing. I'm telling you, you serve in any one kind of God. And the only thing keeping you from being anyone is you. The only thing keeping you from being the anyone God is looking to bless is the fact that you won't simply answer the call. He says, I'm just looking for anyone. But as I said, he says, is there anyone from the house of Saul? Is there anyone from the house of Saul? You have to understand, Saul was the first king of Israel. Some of you remember that. Some, Saul was the very first king of Israel, and he started off great, okay, as many of us do. Many times God begins to put his hand on our lives, and the reason he puts his hand on it is because in that moment of our lives, we're all about him. We're running in the direction of the Lord. We want the things of God. We're desperate for God to use us to touch anyone. But here's the problem. God starts using him. And before long, Saul begins to read his own press clippings. Saul begins to take his eyes off the Lord and he puts it on himself and a heart that was once completely and totally surrendered to God, a heart that once said, there is no way I could ever be king, is now demanding everybody, you better recognize who you're dealing with. I'm t what I'm trying to get you to see is the heart matters most to God. I don't care about your talent. God's not interested in your talent. Your talent's cool, God gave it to you. But the thing you need to steward more than you steward your little singing voice, more than you steward your little business, more than you steward your little creative ideas, you need to steward your heart. It's been entrusted to you. So all of a sudden, he says, is there anyone from the house of Saul? Now, the crazy thing is, as you got to remember, if you read your Bible, we know that Saul hated David. He hated him. In fact, multiple times. He tried to kill him. He was literally throwing spears at him. And David spent a specific season of his life hiding in caves away from this madman named Saul. Saul and David were at odds. Actually, Saul was at odds with David. So all of a sudden, that's why you got to understand it's a little crazy that all of a sudden David's like, is there anybody in the house of Saul? Because he's asking, is there anybody in the house of the guy that tried to kill me? that I can show kindness to. But notice, I want you to notice this, and I'm building something here. We're gonna go somewhere, I promise. He doesn't just say Saul's name. He says, is there anybody in the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? Listen to this, for Jonathan's sake. For Jonathan's sake. And some of you are like, who's Jonathan? Jonathan Huffman right here on the front row. <laughs> He's in the Bible. No, no, no. Jonathan is Saul's son, who actually is also, if you remember, David's best friend. Saul had a son named Jonathan. And here's the thing I want you to see is David says, is there anybody from the house of Saul that I can bless for the sake of Jonathan? Notice the son changed the family trajectory. One kid was able to say, you know what? I know I may have been raised by that, but I refuse to repeat that. I may have been raised by a guy who's into killing people, but actually I'm going to befriend the guy my dad tried to kill. Just because you were raised by it doesn't mean you got to repeat it. I know you were raised by a racist. You don't got to repeat the racism. I know you were, you were raised by a bigot. You don't got to, you don't got to perpetuate and repeat the bigotry. I know you were raised by a dad who had, who died with sexual issues. You do not have to repeat the sick cycle of your sexual issues. God could break the curse through you. God could turn it around through you. All it takes is a grown man to say, I know I honor my dad, but I do not have to repeat my dad. I am not Saul 2.0. I'm Jonathan. And Jonathan's got a different culture. And notice it put a different taste in David's mouth for even Saul. He's blessing the house of Saul because of Jonathan's decision. All it takes is one person to stand up and say, hey, the dysfunction, it stops with me. The alcoholism, it stops with me. The porn, it stops with me. The sleeping around, the being a sexist and, and a bigot, and like I said, a racist, it stops with me. I know nobody else in your family has ever said yes to God. You could be the first. Woo! This is better than you're shouting tonight. Jonathan literally put a different taste in David's mouth toward his own dad. 
says, where's somebody in the house of Saul? Because I'm going to bless him, not for Saul's sake, for Jonathan's sake. And so all of a sudden, he's looking to and fro. He's like, is there anybody? And all of a sudden, they find out. Now, you have to understand, in this specific moment, as we're going to see in a minute, Saul and Jonathan, they're dead. They died on the battlefield of the, they died on the same battlefield the same day, same battle. Saul and Jonathan are both gone. So, so David's look, looking to and fro, and he's like, who, who's still alive? I know Saul and I know Jonathan are no longer alive, but who is still alive? And I think that's the kind of legacy you want to leave, that even after you're gone because you live such a big life, people are still just wanting to bless people who are connected to you. I know that you didn't bless me, but your daddy sure did, and so I'm going to bless you. Maybe that's how you provide an inheritance for your children, is by the, con- by the way you conduct yourself while you're here. That's the kind of life I want to live. That's the kind of legacy I want to leave. That even after I'm gone, people love me so much. They're like, I want to bless his kids. I know I can't bless him anymore. I know he's gone. He's gone on to glory, but I want to bless his kids. I want to make a way for what he lived for to continue. Woo! That's the kind of life I want to live. So all of a sudden, I'm told myself I'm not going to do this crying thing anymore. (sighs) Okay, I'm good. He starts looking to and fro. He's going around saying, who is left in the house of Saul? And all of a sudden, they find this guy who used to be the servant of Saul. And his name is Ziba, Ziba, however you want to say it. And they bring him to to David. And he says, are you Ziba? Are you Ziba? Which is it? He's like, I'm your servant. He's like, that's good. Okay. (laughs) He says, I'm at your service. And so all of a sudden, he looks at him. He says, is there anybody left in the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God to? And Ziba says, you know, now that I think about it, There's still one young man alive. There's still one little guy alive. His name's Mephibosheth, but here's the thing. He doesn't exactly look like a king. Here's the thing. Saul was heads and shoulders taller than everybody else. He doesn't necessarily look like he's connected to Saul, but he is. He's Saul's grandson. He's the son of Jonathan. And David's like, where is he? And he says, oh, he's... He's in Lodabar, but as I said, he, he's not like everybody else. And you can imagine David's like, what, what, what's, what's wrong with him? He says, actually, his, his feet don't work. His feet don't work. He's lame in his feet. He's connected to the right people, but can't do anything about it. Comes from the right family, but something happened to his feet. And here's the problem. You and I... If we were to just start reading our Bible, let's say all of a sudden we turn and open in our Bible app and it says, hey, today you're going to read 2 Samuel chapter 9. You begin reading. You can naturally begin to, to make assumptions as to what in the world happened to Mephibosheth. What in the world? You can begin to assume, uh, maybe he's just, he just born this way. That sucks. You know what I mean? Maybe he's just born that way. Like, how terrible, how tragic. Like, he didn't do anything. Nobody else did anything. Like, just kind of born that way. Dang. And then you keep reading. Or maybe you could even go a, little bit, go a little bit this direction because this is often the direction I think many of us go when it comes to assuming why people have their issues. That's what I'm talking about. Many of us assume we already know why you are the way you are rather than actually getting to know what happened. We can begin to think, oh, he must have made some dumb choice. He must have been doing something stupid and now he had to reap whatever he sowed. He's, he, he's crippled because of his own choices. You know how many times I've heard that, especially out of people in the church? Oh, they're just that way because I guess they just choose to be. Now, I am not neglecting people's choices. I'm not saying that people aren't responsible for what the things that they choose to do. But not everybody is where they are by choice. So all of a sudden... If we would just take a second, I know we're in 2 Samuel chapter 9, but if we were to just take a second to pause our story here, to look deeper into the character of Mephibosheth, we could turn back five chapters to 2 Samuel chapter 4. We could begin to turn back the pages of his story. And that is many of, many of our, our problem in the church, is we are unwilling to take time to turn back the pages of people's stories. Maybe if you were to take some time to turn back the pages of their story, you would understand. You'd have a little more empathy for why they are why they, the way they are. I'm not saying you would learn to excuse it. I'm saying you'd be empathetic towards it. You'd have the heart of God towards it. So all of a sudden, if we do, 
begin to flip back through the pages of Mephibosheth's story. And we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 4, we find this. 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. Let's throw it up. It says this. Saul's son, Jonathan, had a son named Mephibosheth, who was crippled, here it is, as a child. He was five years old, just five years old, when the report from Jezreel that Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle came. When the child's nurse heard the news, she picked, up, she picked him up and fled. But as she hurried away, listen to this, as she hurried away, she dropped him and he became crippled. So all of a sudden we see, if we turn back the pages of the story for a second, the guy a moment ago we were assuming was born this way, or even we dared assume caused this to happen to himself, we now see that he was, he was dropped. He was dropped. He was dropped at five years old and left lame the rest of his life. And notice, not just dropped by someone, not just some random person trying to do, do a good deed, the person who was supposed to care for him, he was dropped by his nanny. Can you relate? And this is the part I started getting, tor I started getting torn up about as I was prepping because God told me there were going to be people listening, listening to me preach this message tonight who as a kid, you were dropped. Emotionally, you were dropped. Relationally, you were dropped. Sexually, you were dropped. The person who was supposed to take care of you, the person who was supposed to make sure nothing happened to you, they dropped you. And you now still bear the scars from it. How many of us, ooh, here we go. How many of us still are struggling because of something that happened to us when we were just a kid? That's called trauma. And I think right now that's a bit of a buzzword. I think right now everybody wants to claim trauma this, trauma that. But just because some people falsely claim trauma doesn't mean there's not real trauma. I think there are many of us who are, listen, I think there are many of us who are still struggling with wounds in our lives at 18, at 22, at 25, at 30 because of something that happened to us when we were eight years old. Your parents get a divorce and you're dropped by the divorce. Never to recover to this day. All of a sudden you go over to your uncle's house and something happens to you. You're taken advantage of as a young kid and the person who was supposed to look after you took advantage of you. And now you are still scarred to this day by a way that you were dropped as a child. I don't know how you were dropped, but I know in one way or another we were all dropped. I know in one way or another we all have things that are still, we can't keep a boyfriend, we can't keep a girlfriend because our dad or our mom weren't good to us. We got trust issues. We got things alive inside of us that somebody else birthed. I preached two weeks ago about when the battle chooses you. I feel like some of us, the battle chose you and you are still fighting it. You still can't break the porn addiction because you came across your dad's magazines as a kid. You didn't ask for it. Just playing hide and go seek and come across something you can't ever unsee. And now it's got its fangs in your jugular and it won't let go. I think there are many of us who as a kid we were dropped and we're still bearing the pain from the way that we were dropped. And I wanna let you know that there's hope. I wanna let you know that you don't have to live that way for the rest of your life. I know that by now, it's probably been at least a decade. If it happened to you when you were a kid, it's been about a decade. And I know after about a decade of dealing with something and swearing to God that you'll never deal with it again, coming to the altar, laying it down, nailing it to the cross, only to walk back home and pick it right back up. I understand the way that things can go, but I'm telling you, even after a decade of the sick cycle of surrendering it and then picking it back up, surrendering it and picking it back up, I'm here to tell you tonight there's real freedom. There's freedom from the way that you were dropped. 
Mephibosheth was dropped by the person who was supposed to care for him. And now he's crippled. So all of a sudden we see David's like, hey, where, where is this guy? He says, where is he? I, okay, I, notice he doesn't even bat an eye to the fact that he's crippled. He doesn't go, oh, dang, bummer. I wonder if I can, I wonder if this can still work. I guess we can try it. He doesn't bat an eye. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't change anything for him. I'm here to tell you tonight, God already knows the things you are disqualifying yourself with, and it doesn't change anything for him. All the reasons, I'm going to preach this here in a little bit, but all the reasons you've given God to walk away haven't convinced him once. What makes you think you're going to start tonight? So David doesn't even bat an eye, so all of a sudden he goes, okay, where, where is this guy, Mephibosheth? Where is he? And Ziba or Ziba, however you want to say it, says he lives right now in Lodabar. He lives in Lodabar. Now the Bible, listen to me, the Bible mentions the name of this place that Mephibosheth is living. It mentions it twice, which tells you the redundancy is to drive a point home. I would say that if the Bible mentions a thing once, it's important for us to look at. But if he mentions it twice that he lives in Lodabar, I think it's important for us to see. So all of a sudden we look and we begin to peel back. What does it mean that he lives, he's living in Lodabar. And what you have to understand is Lodabar means this. Lodabar means no pasture. No pasture. It means pastureless. You know what a pasture is? We live in West Texas. I pray that if you've never been on one, you've heard of it. A pasture is where sheep or oxen or cattle, animals go to graze. And typically in this day and age, a shepherd would be out there in the pasture with them. And this young man, listen to me, this young man who was born for a palace, he has royal blood flowing through his veins, isn't just not living in a palace, he's not even living in a pasture. He settled for a place where there's no life, there's no growth, there's no sustenance. He lives in a place where there's no pasture. And I find it, listen to me, I couldn't help but get to this point and begin to study these words. And I couldn't help but think, it's crazy that David is looking for this guy. Because David is the one who taught us that God longs to find us and lead us to a pasture. Let's turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23 verses 1 through 2, if we can throw it up on the screen. David writes this, the Lord, this is David, the Lord is my shepherd. And I shall not want, and he makes me lie down in green pastures. David pinned this. And ironically, David is the guy looking for the man who isn't living in a pasture. I'm here to tell you, when you know what God longs for you, you begin to realize that he longs for it for everyone. The pastures aren't just for me. That guy over there, I'm, not, I'm done with you living in a place where there's no pasture. I'm done with you sitting in these six cycles of self-sabotage. Can I tell you right now, you're not a bad friend for telling your friend they're being stupid. They're not stupid, but they're acting as though they're something they are not. I'm telling you, my favorite friends are the ones that confront me in love. They love me fiercely, but they speak to me honestly. And I think David all of a sudden realized he's living in no pasture. I know that God longs for his kids to be in green pastures, let alone a place that there's no pasture. And he begins to go after this guy who has settled for no pasture. Get this. This is the second thing that Lodabar means. Lodabar doesn't just mean no pasture, but it also means this. Don't miss this. It means no word. No word. No communication is another way to say that. No word. You know you're living in Lodabar when you begin to live like there's no word from God over your life. You know you are choosing to live in Lodabar when you are calling the word of God spoken over you as if it doesn't exist, it's null and void, it's done because of the decisions that you made rather than realizing God spoke it having already defactored every decision you would ever make into it. When you begin to live like there's no word, you know you're living in Lodabar. And this is the crazy thing. And I said it a moment ago. But this guy, Mephibosheth, is the grandson of King Saul. He's the grandson of a king. And he's living in Lodabar. He's got royal DNA. He comes from a royal bloodline. And he is choosing 
to live in Lodabar. I think that that is a phenomenal image of what many of us live in today. Walking around with the DNA of a king. Walking around with the DNA of heaven. Walking around with royal crimson Jesus Christ blood flowing through your veins. And you still choose to live in Lodabar. You got royal blood. You got royal DNA. And you choose to live in Lodabar. This is what I felt the Lord ask, tell me to ask you. How long have you been living in Lodabar? God, I hope you're getting this. I hope you are getting this. How long have you been living in Lodabar? How long have you accepted that there's just never going to be any pasture for me? I understand that their relationship with God is great. It looks good. They're, they're leading people to Jesus. But for me, no. No pasture. I understand there's a word spoken over their life, but me? <laughs> nah, if I ever heard a word from God, it wouldn't probably need to be bleeped out. Wouldn't be good. Living like there's no word. Living like there's not a pasture with your name on it. Walking around with the DNA of heaven. But living in Lodabar. I'm telling you right now, this DNA thing is actually legitimate. You have the DNA of heaven on the inside of you, spiritually. I've taught you this before, but let's throw this up. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 verse 1 says this. Everyone who believes that Jesus, Christ is, uh, Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Now you have to understand, the Bible wasn't written in English, okay? And that word born in the original language is the word gineo, Okay? Gineo. And what gineo means, it's literally where we get the idea of gene, like your genes in your bloodstream, your genealogy. Gineo quite literally means regened. So if we read it that way, it says anyone who believes Jesus is the Christ has been regened of God. What does that mean? It means you no longer have the same sinful DNA you once had. Though you may sin, you can no longer call yourself a sinner. You have been regened of God. And the only thing that keeps you from living that is because you refuse to believe it. You've been regened. This is why 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you can throw it up, says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This is not one day in the sweet by and by when I finally graduate to heaven. It will be. No, it says he is a new creation. You're not a cleaned up old creation. You're not an old creation with a new paint job. You're not an old creation with a new bumper sticker. You've not been detailed. You've been regened. God, I hope you're getting this. I hope you're being quiet because you're really taking this in for what it actually is. You've got the DNA of a king on the inside of you, and some of you are choosing to live in Lodabar. How long? How long have you been living in Lodabar? How long have you been living in that place where there's no pasture, there's no hope, there's nothing for you? How long have you been in Lodabar? And here's the crazy thing. All of a sudden, David says, go get him. Go get Mephibosheth. And here's the cool thing I want to show you is David has to send people to go get Mephibosheth. They literally go and they find him in Lodabar and they pick him up. Remember, he's crippled. How cruel would it be to say, hey, if you can make the journey on in, we want to bless you. What? And I want to show you, God never asks you to do anything he knows you don't have the capacity to do. God will never ask you to do anything he knows you don't possess what it takes. Even if he has to send somebody else who does have what it takes, he'll send somebody else. But if he's asking you to do it, he knows you have it. So all of a sudden, David says, go, go, go fetch him. That's literally the way the King James Version says it. He says, go fetch Mephibosheth. And so all of a sudden, they go to Lodabar. They go to this place with no pasture, no word, and they go and pick him up. And the thing I want you to see is this. You can't get yourself out of Lodabar. You can't get yourself out of Lodabar. I know that's all you've ever known. I know that you moved in when you were five. I know it's nice and cozy, and I know you'd like to leave. But listen to me. You can't get yourself out of Lodabar. Somebody's got to pull you out. David sends somebody, says, hey, go fetch him. Go get him out of there. 
And here's the next thing, and this is powerful right here. You've got to be willing to be carried again. Ooh, I felt the Holy Ghost on that. You got to be willing to be carried again. Let's think about this for a second. He got in his predicament by being carried. He was crippled because he let someone carry him. And now God is saying, I need you to subject yourself to the very thing that hurt you last time, but trust because it's me now. What I'm trying to get you to understand is God's not asking you to trust, to trust their hands again. He's not saying, hey, go back to those people, go back to your parents, go back to all those people that dropped you as a kid and trust their hands again. God's not saying, hey, trust their hands. He's saying, trust mine. Trust my hands. I didn't drop you. And so many of us, we keep God at arm's length. We, keep God, we give God a stiff arm because of what somebody else did. Somebody who wasn't God. And I'm here to tell you right now, can I just dispel this crap, this crap theology out of your mind that says you went through that and be, because God signed off on it? As if God signs off on your, on your suffering, that he's just gonna send suffering to you? Jesus says, in this world, in this world, not in my hand, but in this world, you will have trials and tribulation, but take heart for I, he makes a distinction, trials, tribulation, that's the world. I have overcome the world. So when, you, when the world tries to touch you, just remember that you're in my hand. Just remember that my grip of grace is already over your life. I'm telling you, Jesus can't give you something he doesn't have. Jesus can give healing because he has healing. Jesus can bless because he has blessing to give. Jesus does not possess sickness. Therefore, he cannot give sickness. I know I'm wrecking your world right now, and you're like, oh, he's a heretic. Have fun living in that reality. Have fun living believing the guy you're supposed to worship is the reason you're on your, you're on your face thrown up against a rock. That you threw me up against the rock, but now I'm going to worship you because I'm thrown up against the rock. What? Heresy. It's a doctrine of demons. It's a document the devil drew up and he forged God's signature on it. So you would just go with it. This was not the plan of God. But sometimes we go through things that God didn't want us to. And that doesn't mean that God's not through. So all of a sudden he sends somebody and he says, go, go, go fetch. Go fetch him. Because you can't get yourself out of Lodabar and you've got to be willing to trust being carried once again. Some of you, that's the reason that you haven't come to Jesus is because you don't trust him to carry you. You know you can't make the journey, but you don't trust him to come and pick you up. Do you know that that's what grace wants to do? Grace wants to pick you up out of that place that you were dropped as a child. Can I just be honest with you? I'm talking about that thing you still haven't told anyone about. I'm not talking about that stuff, that, that, that minor stuff that kind of like that patina at the top of the lake sludge that you're like, yeah, I'm willing to be open about that. I'm talking about that dead corpse at the bottom of the lake that no one knows is there but you. I'm talking about that thing tonight, that place that you were dropped as a kid that's just been, that's just been disintegrating all these years. I'm talking about that place. You gotta be willing to trust again. Can I tell you this? Your blessing is on the other side of your trusting. Your blessing is on the other side of your trusting. And I know it would be easy to count that as just some quippy little statement because it rhymes, but listen to me. I don't care that it rhymes. It's true. Your blessing. I'm not saying it to sound preachy or sound like I'm smart and sound like a good communicator. I'm saying it because I know it's true. Your blessing is always on the other side of you being willing to start trusting again. So all of a sudden we begin to see that Mephibosheth is picked up by these guys and he's carried to the king. He's carried to King David. He's picked up out of Lodabar and he's carried to Jerusalem. I don't know about you, but that's a picture of the gospel. That we were in one place one day, but then all of a sudden God dispatched his grace and his grace met us and it picked us up and it carried us where we could never carry ourselves. And this is a picture of the grace of God. So all of a sudden Mephibosheth, he makes it all the way back to King David's palace, and you can imagine they, they wheel him in there, or he hobbles in there. I'm not sure how he, I don't know if he had crutches or if he was just walking on broken feet. But he gets in there before King David, and King David 
looks at him. He says, are you Mephibosheth? He says, I'm at your service, sir. And you can begin to hear the, 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 the fear inside of Mephibosheth's voice, voice. Because listen to me, the reason his nanny ran with him was because she was afraid the next king would kill him. That's what happens when a king died. King Saul and King John, or Jonathan, the, the rightful successor to the throne, they all died. So this nanny picked Mephibosheth up and ran and dropped him, but she was running to try to save his life. And that's a picture that even our best human efforts to try to save each other still break each other. We can't do it. You can't save this community. I can't save this community. Me preaching over this microphone is trying to convince you to trust the one who can. I can't do it. I can only tell you about the help I found. I can only tell you where I got my grace. Because I need it just as bad as you. So all of a sudden we see that Mephibosheth gets scared. And we know he gets scared because David says this, don't be afraid. And you can't speak to something you don't see. Some of y'all missed that. I said, you can't speak to something you don't see. Some things in your life have gone haywire and it's because you've refused to look at them. You're so intimidated by it and you just let it run rampant because you refuse to stare it in the eye and speak the word of God over it. David sees he's, 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 he's quivering in fear. He says, don't be afraid. And all of a sudden you can see Mephibosheth looks up at him, standing in the court of the king. And this is what David says to him. Let's look at it. 2 Samuel chapter 9. <laughs> Verse 7, 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7, it says this. We get through verse 7. There we go. It says this, and David said to him, him is Mephibosheth. He said, do not fear, for I will show you kindness for, for, your, for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat. Listen to this part. Don't miss this. You shall eat at my table always. You will always eat at my table. Ooh. Now, before all of a sudden the, the surface level preaches to that, let's begin to dissect what this looks like. Mephibosheth is standing in the court of King David. His feet are buckled. He can barely hold himself up. He's more than likely leaning on someone or a crutch. And King David stares at him. He says, no, no, don't, don't be afraid. I'm going to be good to you. Not only am I going to restore all the land that was stripped from you, you're going to eat at my table. Not that you're going to eat at some other table. You're going to eat at my table for the rest of your life. You're set for life. And as I was thinking about this, man, the story has been on my heart. I've never preached this story before. And God put it on my heart and I began to think about it. I began to think, what is the family dinner at the, at the, at the palace going to look like now that Mephibosheth is there? Because the truth is you have to understand more than one person, it's not going to be just King David and little Mephibosheth there at the dinner table. There's going to be a bunch of other people who no doubt, listen to me, don't miss this, no doubt have strong feet. Mephibosheth's feet are broken and he's going to be going to dinner with people every night who walk there without a problem. Can you imagine? I know it's great to be invited to a dinner, but can you imagine that quiet little voice of condemnation that would begin to erode and eat at him saying, you don't, you don't belong here. Look at you hobbling over the dinner table looking at everybody else just strutting. They don't even pay a second thought to it. And he's over there hobbling to the dinner table. And this is the thing that God showed me, and this wrecked me. And I pray it wrecks you. The crazy thing about being invited to the table is that at the table... You don't need your feet. You don't need your feet at the dinner table. In fact, no one needs their feet at the dinner table. So whether you have broken feet or you have perfect feet, you can dance like Braden Jowers. It doesn't matter because at the table, all that matters is that you put the pressure on the seat. 
I'm telling you, your weakness does not take away from the experience God has put your name on. And their strength doesn't add anything to it. Whether your feet are broken or your feet are strong, your feet don't bring anything to this table. You don't need your feet where God's called you. I know they're broken. You don't need them. I know that place is forgotten. I know it's moldy. I know it's dusty. I know you've counted yourself out time and time again. But the thing he knows is something you don't know is that you actually don't need that where I've called you. You don't need your feet when you're in your seat. I'm telling you there are people in here you refuse to come to God. You're refusing to come to God because you think that that fractured, fragmented part of your soul is going to somehow tamper with the experience of heaven, tamper with the experience of church. And you're saying, no, I would never be accepted there. They couldn't factor in my dysfunction. I'm here to tell you, your dysfunction, your disability, it doesn't disqualify you. Your disability... Physically, mentally, emotionally, sexually, I don't care how you were dropped, it does not disqualify you from the grace of God. And I can preach this like this because I'm Mephibosheth. I know I'm preaching to a bunch of Mephibosheths, but listen to me, I myself am a Mephibosheth. I don't get to stand here and hold this microphone and lead this ministry because I've somehow gotten here. God picked me up out of my load of bar and he brought me to the table. And if I'd just be willing to trust what he has put my name on, put all my weight on it, Take the weight off my weakness. Take the weight off my brokenness. And quit thinking that everybody else is here because they're somehow stronger than me and they're able to hold themselves here. Nobody's feet are working at the dinner table. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how fractured you are. And here's the thing, and this is where I die down. I don't know if I've preached long enough. Mephibosheth, just like you and I, pushed back against this. David says, you, you've got it. you're going to eat at my table. And Mephibosheth goes, no. He does what you and I do. He does what you are doing right now. You go, that sounds really nice, Kenan, but no. He says this. Let's throw it up. Let's throw it back up. Actually, it's, it's verse 8. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 8. And he paid homage and he said this. This is Mephibosheth. What is your servant that you should show regard, listen to this, for a dead dog such as I? Who am I to sit at your table? Who am I to do this with you? Who am I to dine with you? I'm a dead dog. You got the wrong man. He says, who am I? And I love this. If you read the passage, David completely ignores him. (laughs) David doesn't even respond and say, hey, you're not. He doesn't even go, you're not a dead dog. He completely ignores him and he begins to speak to Ziba and say, you know what? You and your sons, yeah, you guys, you are going to reap, you're going to, you guys are going to plant stuff and you're going to reap it and he's going to eat it. Another picture of the grace of God. Mephibosheth is going to eat of that which he didn't work for. All of a sudden he says, it's it's not about you, Mephibosheth. You got to remember what opened David's heart to this in, in the first place. He says, is there anybody in the house of Saul that I can show the kindness of God to on behalf of Jonathan's sake? Who's Jonathan? Mephibosheth's father. Woo! You don't get to sit at the table because you've somehow gotten it all together. You somehow hobbled your way to the table and he's taking pity on you. The only reason you are at the table is because of who your father is. The only reason you're blessed is because of who your daddy is. I'm telling you right now, this has nothing to do with whether you're a, a prize winning breed or you're a dead dog. It has everything to do with who your father is. I'm blessing you not because you're so great. I'm blessing you because of your daddy. You're reaping the benefit of what your dad sowed. And this is what I felt, and this is why I titled this message, Stop Squirming. Mephibosheth in this moment is squirming. 
He's saying, who am I that I should sit at your table? And I felt literally I was laying in bed last night. I told you I couldn't sleep. And the Lord spoke this in my ear and it rang and it rang and it rang. And I wanted to add to it. I wanted to finish it off. But he said, no, just tell him these two words. Stop squirming. There are some of you right now, the Lord is coming to pick you up out of your Lodabar. And you are beginning to squirm. You're beginning to push back. You're beginning to fight. And I feel the Lord saying, stop squirming. and Take a seat. Stop squirming. And take a seat. And right now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you a moment to stop squirming. I want to give you a moment to embrace the grace that traveled all this way to your Lodabar to pick you up out of your miry clay, to pick you up out of the place that was pastureless, that had no pasture and there was no word. That means there's no hope. Pick you up out of your desolate place and set your feet upon a rock. Bring you to his banqueting table. He sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I don't know about you, but sometimes I am my own enemy. And even when I am against me, God is still for me. Even when I'm against me, he's still for me. And if you would say, Kenan, I'm Mephibosheth. I, I'm, I'm the person that God had you preach this message for, that he had you stirred all day praying for. If you would say, Kenan, I was dropped as a kid or something happened to me and I got off the rails. I'm broken, I'm fragmented, I'm fractured on the inside. And you would say, Kenan, I'm ready for that grace to come and pick me up out of my right, my reclay and set my feet upon a rock. Set me at his banqueting table. If you're ready to stop squirming tonight and start trusting. When I count to three, I'd just like you to shoot your hand. One, God loves you. Two, now is your moment. Three, if that's you, come on right now. Hands going up all over this place. If it's the first time or for the first time in a long time, hands going up. I'm going to give you one more moment. Leave it up. Leave it up. You didn't come this far to back down now. Leave it up and I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you right now for every hand that is raised to heaven because that hand represents a heart that has just been yielded to you. Lord, I thank you that you are rushing into their load of bar right now and you are pulling them out with your strong right hand and you are setting their feet upon a rock. You make their feet strong, God, right now. Now, I speak to the, their spiritual, sexual ankles, and I say, be strengthened once again. The, fl- the places you've been broken, the places you've been fractured, you're no longer going to be anymore. And even if you go back and you try to live in Lodabar again, the grace of God will dispatch itself, and it will go and pull you back out and set you at your banqueting, ta- banqueting table, because that's where you're supposed to eat the rest of your life. I thank you for it right now. And in in the mighty name of Jesus, I call every hand raised to heaven, saved, secure, yours. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, come on. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus.